Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon, or this morning, rather. I say afternoon is because it's just before lunch, so I'm sure usually people are awake going into that lunchtime, and I'll try not to be uh, too long. As was mentioned, the topic is, has God offered salvation to all people? I want to start by a little uh, story of sorts. The boy who held his little boat and said, it's mine, I made it, suffered a keen disappointment. One day, with exuberant expectation, he carried his boat to the shore of the lake and sailed it on the clear blue water. The little boat skimmed along the gentle breeze as the gentle breeze its sails across the rippling waves. Then suddenly, a gust of wind caught the little boat and snapped the string the boy was holding. Out further and further, the little boat sailed until it vanished from sight. Sadly, the boy made his way home without his prized possession. It was lost. The weeks and months went by. Then one day, as the boy passed a toy shop, something caught his attention. Could it be? Was it really? He looked closer. It was, yes, there in the display window was his own little boat. Overjoyed, the boy bolted into the store and told the owner about the boat on display. It really belonged to him. He'd made it, hadn't he? I'm sorry, the shopkeeper said, but it's my boat now. If you want it, you have to pay the price for it. Sad at heart, the little boy left the store, but he was determined to get his boat back, even though it meant working and saving until he had enough money to pay for it. At last the day came. Clutching his money in his fist, he walked into the store and spread his hard-earned money out on the uh, countertop. I've come back to buy my boat, the boy said. The clerk counted the money. It was enough. He, reaching into the showcase, the storekeeper took the boat and handed it to the eager boy. The lad's face lit up with a smile of satisfaction as he held the little boat in his arms. You're mine, he said twice mine, mine because I made you, and now mine because I bought you. Everything, all of mankind was created and came into being by the power of God. God breathed into man the breath of life, his spirit. When Adam and Eve sinned, their spiritual bond, the string, was severed. Christ, our Lord, paid the price, sacrificed himself, and thereby becoming the way for men to be forgiven of their sins, redeemed and able to reestablish the spiritual bond with God, returning once again to the Creator. So has God offered salvation to all people? Well, the answer is yes. And God doesn't determine arbitrarily who is going to be saved and lost. He lets us make that decision. There's no limitation based on one's gender, social strata, education level, race, or country of origin. Salvation is offered to all. There's no number. It's available, again, to all. Now, unfortunately, we know more will decline the offer of salvation through obedience to the gospel and be lost, and there will be those who decide to obey. You can read that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where we read about the wide and the narrow gates. Salvation is obtained through Christ, Acts 4 and 12, all men, regardless of origin or heritage, as noted in Acts 28, 28. Gentiles are mentioned there, and that includes you and me. Salvation is for everyone who believes, that is, belief followed by obedience, as we read in Romans 1 and 16. Pre-selection. Now, the Calvinists and some others have a perspective that humans are born bad from the womb, and having the mental capacity to perceive uh, before that is having mental capacity, capacity to perceive and make a decision concerning anything that they might do, any interactions. And not only that, salvation, or damnation for that matter, has been determined in advance, and it's unavoidable. Either you will be saved, or it's unattainable, and anything you do is irrelevant. Now, this decision, it's presumed, is made by God before any person has a chance to hear or read a Bible and make a decision concerning the gospel of Christ. Salvation, is it something that you can stumble on? Is it something that you can't avoid? Well, the previous lessons have told us that regarding sin, sometimes it's even subtle and we're not even aware of 
not only that it's there, but the impact that it's having on our lives. To say yes either means that man has no free will, but in each instance of salvation we re that are recorded in God's word, we see that there was some type of discussion, some type of teaching. In no instance was there anybody who was forcibly baptized. We don't see anybody being grabbed by the collar and thrust under the water and saying that now you're saved. That, that, that's not how it happens. It's a sampling of scriptures that we're uh, going to dis look at and that are in your book. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. We learn God's will by reading his word, the Bible. If after reading it, we decide mm, we don't like it and we don't want to obey, then we're not doing the will of the Father and we forfeit entry into the kingdom of heaven. It's our choice to make. God gave us that choice. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, should not implies that there's a possibility that one may believe yet perish. Should not. So belief must be followed by action. In John 14 and 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are two paths regarding how to react to the knowledge of the gospel. Both are conscious choice or decisions that each individual makes. Again, Calvinism, if you're not familiar with it, refers to the Reformed tradition of Protestant denominations established by men, meaning not the church established on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter two, or to that which the Lord adds is saved. Today, the term Calvinist also means the doctrines and practices of the Reformed churches of which John Calvin was an early leader. And the system is perhaps best known for its doctrines of predestination and total depravity. Calvinists broke from the Roman Catholic Church back in the 16th century. Uh, some think perhaps also that they're too bad to be forgiven. Uh, but the man we know as the Apostle Paul Remember, if we read in Acts 8 and 1, he was consenting to the stoning of Stephen, one of Christ's disciples, and also later was seeking Christians to have them put in prison in Acts chapter 8 and also chapter 9. So not really a nice guy as he's first presented, yet he became a Christian, and that is recorded later in Acts chapter 9, verse 18 in particular, where he is baptized. So there... There is hope, even for one who seemed upon initial meeting was hopeless. So who cannot be saved? Believe it or not, the Bible does speak of those who cannot be saved. Among those are those who deny Christ. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 10, 33. Some acknowledge both God and Christ, yet still choose not to obey. They cannot therefore be saved. Neither can those who devise their own terms and refuse to obey the commands recorded in the Bible. We can read in 1 Peter 4, 17, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now regarding the one who say, or the saying, uh, own terms, uh, I ask the question, why would one think they know better than he who spoke into existence everything in the universe. Seems a bit presumptuous that humans who struggle or have struggled over time to determine how to form something useful out of existing materials, uh, minerals, ores, liquid plants, whatever, can presume to establish the terms of salvation or acceptance, trying to play let's make a deal with the one who created everything by saying that is the one who created all things let there be light, Genesis 1 and, and 3. Uh, let there be a firmament, Genesis 1 and 6. And see verses 9, water and dry land were formed by speaking them into existence. Grass, herbs, fruit trees, all through Genesis we can read. And of course, he formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Genesis 2 and 7. He created all things, yet we want to say, yeah, you created all this, and I'm here because of you, but I've got an idea. 
I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> Some have the philosophy they'll only belay, obey rather the recorded commands with which they agree. So are we sitting in judgment of God? As though some commandments can be kept and others ignored? We saw that in one of the earlier lessons. We must all obey what God has given us. And having been perfected, he became the author of salvation to all who obey him. We read that in Hebrews 5 and 9. He's not talking about man. He's talking about God and Christ. I haven't yet found in the Bible where obedience to any Bible command was open for negotiation. Christianity is not a la carte. Pick this and that from the Bible uh, when it comes to doctrines or commands. And we'll try it out and see whether or not I like it. A nation's citizens, and this was pointed out before regarding laws, are expected to obey established laws, and if not, there are consequences ranging from fines to incarceration, or in some cases, even physical death. Christians strive to live a life in line with God's will as revealed in and by his word. To not do so has both physical and spiritual consequences. Again, killing the body and the soul, Matthew 10, 28. Some also wonder, if God is such a loving God, which he is, why would he judge and condemn someone to eternal hell for temporal action or sin? I actually heard this said. People wonder why. You know, I, I just did this little one thing. Why would he hold that against me? We had from Connor's lesson, definitions of sin, to behave contrary to God's will sums it up. He is just and fair which is the reason he does not hide the terms for obtaining grace or forgiveness from anyone, neither does he hide the consequences. We don't have to guess. We know in advance. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. Again, Connor pointed out that in many cases, the appearance was that there was no immediate consequences. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit uh, of, the, of the tree, that they didn't immediately die. However, there was that severing, that spiritual severing from God. Their spiritual life was impacted. Could they see it? Not really, except from the concept of being put out of the garden, but death, that physical consequence, and then later, what would be a spiritual consequence they didn't experience. So Romans 6 provides divine knowledge regarding how Christians are to respond to God's grace and teaches that sin is to be avoided. God's love and grace provide an escape to those who are repentant and strive to be obedient. If God's grace is refused by anyone who knows good from evil, understands what's required, and the consequences, and chooses to do otherwise, that person has chosen their faith. God is being just. He's not going against what he said he would do. No one's going to be forced into doing wrong. It's a conscious choice. To blame God for anyone's own choices is irresponsible, shows a lack of maturity or discernment. It's not what God wants, it's what man chooses. God wants everyone to be saved. Man might choose otherwise. Of course, heaven would not be a place a person would want to be or feel comfortable being if he had no control. If I want to be in control of everything, and going to heaven is one where Everybody, and we've been studying in, in Revelation where everyone praises God and there is no sin, they would not be happy there. The disobedient would not be happy eternally somewhere where disobedience is not allowed. In fact, rebellion wasn't even considered because everyone wants to be in heaven. On the topic of gender, men and women may become Christians. Now, looking at Acts 1.14, we note that after the remaining uh, 11 apostles were listed, the first 13 states, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So there were men and women present. After this, it would appear that only men responded to the first gospel sermon, and the f first the Lord added to the church in uh, Acts chapter 2, 37, and of course 41 through 47. That, of course, is not the case. The term men has used is uh, applicable to both genders of mankind. Uh, to show that women are indeed being baptized and added to the church, we can look to Acts chapter 5, 1, where Ananias and Sapphira, uh, his wife, and as was mentioned earlier, you know, not be perhaps the best example of obedience, but we see that they were Christians. They were mentioned as members, and later in verse 14 we read, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men 
and women. We'll see this in a number of places. This verse clarifies that salvation was available to both genders, men and women. No other options are noted, by the way. In fact, the Bible is consistent with this grouping as seen below. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female, he created them, Genesis 1.27. Male and female, no other options. He created male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created, Genesis 5 and 2. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female, Matthew 19 and 4, and nothing else is mentioned after that as far as uh, gender. But, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, Mark 10 and 6. And there are a couple other examples. Uh, one that's not there uh, regarding uh, disciples, uh, note also the, the disciple, as she's referred to, Tabitha, also known as Dorcas who was raised from the dead in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. So scriptures are replete from noticing, uh, mentioning that there are women who were Christians also, not just men. Uh, also, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 29, Philip revealed the, the gospel and baptized an Ethiopian eunuch. Now the subject of eunuchs come up in Matthew 19, after Christ gave commands regarding allowable grounds for divorce. The disciples conclude it's better not to marry in verse 10. And Jesus responds a couple of verses later, verse 12, said, For there are eunuchs who are born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Of these instances where the terms used, I looked in Divine's dictionary to see, and in a noun form denotes an emasculated man, a eunuch. Uh, 19, Matthew 19 and 12, uh, one naturally incapacitated or voluntarily abstaining from uh, wedlock, uh, one such in a position of high authority in a court or a chamberlain. And again, that refers to Acts 8, 27 through 39. Uh, the little reference you see in your book, perhaps to a 2, 43 through 44, just strike through that. Uh, nevertheless, this noble servant of the queen was not referred to as a she or some hyphenated gender, a eunuch. All reference personal pronouns used in these verses are masculine. Man, his, him, and he. Well, what about your social status, your education level? One might presume that there's a broad or a diverse spectrum of individuals presented during the first gospel's sermon that's recorded in Acts 2 since it was Passover and people were gathered from all places, from the perspective of having what would be considered a formal education is what I'm talking about here, uh, most of the apostles were likely not very well educated or wealthy. It doesn't mean that they were dirt poor. And again, this is a, a presumption. But recall that the first called were four fishermen. Now, fishermen can make a very good living, and it's, it's an honorable profession. Uh, Simon, Peter, Andrew, and James, and John, uh, all fishermen. In contrast, another uh, disciple, uh, an earlier follower of Christ, was totally different from these. That's Levi, a Jewish tax collector. Uh, he had status and some education. It's presumed since he was responsible both to count and to account for the money that he collected. That would only be possible if you had some education. And of course, uh, he was not liked by other Jews because he was working for the Roman government. Even though he was following rules, uh, the idea being that one of the reasons they were looked down on is that sometimes they collected a little bit more than what they were supposed to, and they kept that for themselves. Uh, his position or job didn't phase Christ, though. He saw, that is Christ, into his heart and soul, his true attitude, which was then backed up by his actions. James, too, warns against differentiating between those who are or appear to be either wealthy or poor. All souls have the same value to God, and Christ died so all would have the opportunity for salvation. Now, the lack of formal education was noted. This is just something I didn't come up with uh, by their enemies when they said that they are uneducated and untrained men. In fact, knowing their background, they marveled at them and realized they'd been with Christ, Acts chapter 4 and 13. So their lack of formal education had not kept them from being bold. And it also indicated that that was not a precursor to becoming a Christian, being able to understand God's word. 
and didn't keep them from being bold or from serving the Lord. Now they did have guidance from the Holy Spirit, which was promised by the Lord, and is recorded in John 16 and 3, Acts 1 and 8. We, of course, have the recorded word. By contrast, Saul was very well educated, having been learned at the feet of Gamaliel, a well-known Jewish rabbi of the time. Also indicates that he was from a family that had some type of social status. Uh, he was born a Roman citizen, which many could not claim. So the gospel is aimed at all people of every social strata, and again, regardless of their life before becoming Christians. It may be a bit presumptuous when we take a look at the race or country of origin of people, let's say of the, the eunuch who was uh, of perhaps Ethiopian or uh, descent or African, at least that's where he, he came from, that he was serving in that particular um, capacity. Unless, as it says, presuming that this is the case, uh, race and country of origin did not restrict the spread of the gospel, of course. Uh, when he was preached to, Philip caught up to him and, and preached to him. On the day of Pentecost, we know Jews came from not less than 12 regions, if you read from where they were, were uh, when they were saying, wow, we can each understand what they're saying in our language. But there are 3,000 who gladly received the word and baptized. 3,000, a goodly number, but not all that were there. Later, Cornelius, was a, who was a soldier, a blue-collar worker, and a Gentile, in Acts 10 and 11, the Lord helped Peter understand the gospel was indeed for all by sending him to his house. He presented to him animals that were not supposed to be eaten by Jews. He did that several times to help him understand that anything that God blessed or that directed uh, couldn't, was not unclean. Paul, or rather Peter, concluded, uh, in truth I perceive God shows no person partiality. If you read that scripture, you'll see that the Holy Spirit fell upon those who he was preaching to. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So then Peter proceeded to Cornelius' home when he was asked to come. He preached the gospel to those that were in the household and eventually baptized the believing adults. Now what typically occurs preceding one's obedience or obeying the gospel? Form of a question. A person hears and evaluates what is said. As a quick example, one attends school where lectures are heard, books are read, books are read rather, and the discussion occurs. Hopefully, it's open discussion, so you of what you you've heard, and then you come to a conclusion regarding the information received. And chances are you're going to take a test or two on that knowledge to see whether or not you've uh, understood it, and then you draw a conclusion and perhaps even change our behavior when it comes to studying the scripture, uh, repentance may be the, the result. Now these are active rather than passive events requiring the mental and physical capacity to respond. The same is true with the gospel in every race, country, gender, and social strata must do the same things. You must hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. You have to hear and be able to understand what's being spoken or the written word that you're reading. You have to process what you're seeing and what you're hearing. Understand and be able to discern fact from fiction, able to reason. Repent. Turn away from. Stop doing what it is that you're doing. Again, it's not just being sorry for getting caught, but understanding that sin is offensive to God and that it results in a, a separation of mankind from God and what our ultimate destination or consequence might be. Again, something that the, Evan spoke on earlier, uh, having to recognize and understand what sin is. And then, of course, being baptized, uh, or rather confessing, uh, understanding the implications and consequences, and then being baptized to submit to burial and water where we join in Christ's death for our sins. The blood is washed, his blood washes away our sins as he was buried in the earth and raised to die no more. We're buried in water and we die to sin coming up as a new creature. And of course, having done all that, live faithfully. We continue to read, we continue to study, pray, and teach others. In our lives today, after we've gone to school and pursued a particular uh, line of work, oftentimes you have to go back and get what's called continuing education Credits. You have to continue to go and to learn and keep up to speed on 
what is necessary. Now, of course, in man-made occupations, those rules or techniques may change, but in God's word, they remain constant. So we, we study the scripture, we worship, we interact with fellow Christians, and we fulfill our, 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 our task, that is to seek and save the lost. Now the topic why children cannot be Christians. Uh, because these commands, each of the ones that we just looked at, require a certain mature level of thinking, small children cannot do them. Only those who possess a higher level of reasoning ability can become Christians. And uh, below is a further explanation of these points. Uh, there was one note, since each person matures and learns at a different rate, has different experience and varying capacity, it's not possible to establish a specific age for when one's able to respond to the gospel. So let's just consider a couple of things. Well, here, a child can hear and have, uh, but not necessarily have the knowledge base in order to understand what is being said. Children believe, they believe a lot of things, have a lot of vivid uh, uh, imaginations. So even being taught what they believe and can follow on with, uh, they can really be innocently naive about things. And as human beings, as Christians, we need to be able to discern. Uh, repent, a child that gets caught doing something wrong does feel sorry for being caught. It may go on a little later before perhaps they've experienced, again, a consequence such as uh, Evan had pointed out to their action before they actually stop it. They may not understand the consequences. They cannot truly comprehend what's happening. Well, by the way, this may define also some adults, unfortunately. Uh, confess, can a child articulately, verbally and, uh, articulate verbally and acknowledge who Christ is? And even if they say that, do they know the significance? Being baptized, if baptism is forgiveness of sins, at what age do they go from? Yes, they perhaps can be to, we're fairly sure that they understand. They must know that burial and water is to have sins washed away by the blood of Christ. They must know what that means. They should also know what the church is and what their responsibilities are afterwards. Conclusion. Well, no one has been preselected to be saved or lost. There's no gender, social, or educational constraints, excepting for the ability to comprehend information, reason, and make a responsible decision. Neither does one's race, ethnicity, or country of origin restrict access to salvation, which is available to all who will hear and believe the gospel, repent of their sins, confess Christ as Lord and Savior, and be baptized as buried in water to have one's sins washed away through the blood of Christ. Salvation is available to all, with the only restriction being that an individual must be capable of understanding and responding to the gospel. So how have you, or will you, respond? I appreciate what Connor said in looking and uh, referring to Revelation 22:17, and the spirit and the pride say, come. The water of life is free, but we must come to receive it. Thank you.